business costs, and there's a danger. The increased welfare payments and tax cuts for households will not fully compensate those most vulnerable to the increased costs. The resultant transformation of the Australian economy will reduce economic growth. It must, therefore, also reduce jobs growth. On this point, I note the Treasury modelling assumed full employment, a founding assumption, full employment over the long term. In other words, Treasury assume all workers displaced by the tax will magically find new green jobs. And if this is to happen in a slower growing economy, it can only occur through slower growth in real wages. So every business and every household will pay for the new tax either directly or through income foregone. The Coalition will make it our first priority uh, to get rid of the poorly designed and economically destructive carbon tax. Now the mining tax is also a bad tax. And one of the assumptions underlying the tax was that it would increase the efficiency of the tax system by removing inefficient state royalties and replacing them with a more efficient super profits tax on the mining industry. Now, uh, in practice, the states and territories have not agreed to forego their royalty revenue. So the mining tax is now an additional layer of taxation for the mining industry on top of company tax and royalties. The tax also imposes a significant new administrative burden even on companies that won't have to pay it. Small miners will still need to do all the paperwork, even if they're below the government's threshold. Otherwise, they won't later be allowed to claim legitimate deductions against the tax in the event they succeed and get bigger. And the mining tax will reduce our international competitiveness. It will reduce the incentive for further investment in the mining industry as it compared with the rest of the world. And uh, hampering Australia's comparative advantage in resources is hardly a recipe for continued success and prosperity. Moreover, the mining tax is not the fiscal panacea the government claims. Now, many of you wouldn't be aware of this, but it's an important point to note. Total revenue, net revenue from the mining tax over the next three years is about the same as what the federal government has had to borrow every three months this year to fund its budget deficit. Every three months, the government has borrowed the equivalent, just to fund its deficit, has borrowed the equivalent of the total revenue of the mining tax over the next three years. So in total, the mining tax may raise around 1% more in annual tax revenue for the federal government. So removing those two taxes together will significantly lighten the tax load and deliver a growth dividend to the Australian economy. The Coalition is also committed to reduce personal income tax. That's what we do. This will continue the Coalition's proud record of progressively easing the burden on households. We will deliver lower personal taxes without a carbon tax. And we will have substantially more to say about tax and, importantly, tax administration before the next election. The third step in boosting economic growth will be, obviously, to lift productivity. Both Tony Abbott and myself have previously spoken at length about our comprehensive agenda in this area. Over the long term, only stronger productivity growth will deliver better living standards. The sad truth is that productivity growth has stalled under the government. GDP per hour worked fell over the two years to the December quarter 2011. Australia has been producing less for a given effort. So this is not sustainable for prosperity. It is not the way to get ahead. The poor performance on productivity is not the fault of the workers. It is the result, in many ways, of the dead hand of big government. It is the result also of changes to labour market regulation, which have made uh, the workplace less flexible. It is the result of the erosion of business confidence from a series of anti-business measures, and I might say from the Treasurer anti-business words, uh, and those measures include the carbon and mining tax and, of course, increases in red tape. The Coalition has a compelling strategy to lift productivity. First will be genuine welfare reform to lift participation in work, since there is no one so unproductive as the person who is able to work but is not doing so. Second will be public sector reform to deliver better, more cost-effective services. The third step 
will be red tape reform to cut business regulatory costs by at least a billion dollars a year. Fourth will be competition reform to ensure that large and small businesses are competing on a genuinely level playing field. Fifth will be infrastructure reform to ensure best value for Commonwealth spending. And the final step will be labour market reform to encourage higher pay for better work. And today I want to focus on a few of those key points. Integral to the improvement in the public sector will be the reform of Commonwealth state relations. The current system is a mess of blurred responsibilities, overlapping funding and the perennial blame game. The states receive significant financial support from the Commonwealth. This year the Commonwealth will provide the states with funding totalling $96 billion. Payments for specific tied programs total $48 billion, with general untied payments including the GST of $49 billion. Both the Commonwealth Government and the states have roles in housing, education, health, uh, infrastructure, skills, community services, security, the environment and welfare. In many of these areas, the Commonwealth is not involved in frontline service delivery, which I see as a good thing. I've always believed that delivery of services is best done by the tier of government closest to the need. But the Commonwealth does employ an army of public servants to measure and assess the performance of the states where funding is tied to performance benchmarks. It does not seem to be an efficient use of resources uh, to employ public servants to check on other public servants. The Coalition will be paying particular attention to this area in its 12,000 headcount reduction uh, in the public service in Canberra. <coughs> One area of federal funding of the states where I believe the current arrangements clearly do not seem to be working at all well is in the area of housing. I referred before to international surveys by The Economist magazine and Demographia which show that Australia has some of the least affordable housing in the world. Other surveys show that Australia ranks poorly in, uh, in the ease with which housing can be built due to excessive regulation and cost. Now these are state responsibilities. The 2011-12 budget provided $5.1 billion in specific purpose payments to the states for affordable housing. So that's more, way more than what the mining tax would raise in one year we're giving to the states for housing each year. One of the performance benchmarks is efficiency of the supply of housing through planning reforms. So I'm not convinced that the states are pulling their weight on this. The Coalition will provide incentive payments to states to reduce the regulatory burden and developer levies and to increase land release. And this will be funded by better targeting of existing payments. And we will be listening to the industry and to home buyers to assess whether housing has become more available and more affordable, and if it hasn't, we'll take further action. The key to a productive and efficient economy is competition. In a relatively small economy, such as Australia's, there's a danger. The markets can be dominated by just a few players. In some circumstances, the interests of consumers can become secondary to those of business. The Coalition will have a thorough review of the Competition and Consumer Act. It will particularly focus on access regimes and abuse of market power. Also important will be enhanced competition in banking. The goal must be to ensure credit remains available and affordable for home buyers and businesses and that the system remains a safe repository for household savings. I've previously detailed our nine-point plan to boost competition in banking. Central to this is a root and branch review of the banking system, building on the coalition initiated groundbreaking work done by the Campbell and Wallace inquiries. In the uncertain world following the GFC, we must look again at our regulatory standards and competitive environment to assure that our banks continue to deliver a safe, stable and efficient banking system. A further challenge for Australian industry is the intense pressure for structural change stemming from the rise of China and Asia and the high Australian dollar. The Australian dollar is currently sitting at around $1.06, close to the highest level since the float of the currency in 1983. This has led to a marked loss of competitiveness for some export and uh, import competing industries, with businesses in manufacturing, tourism and education doing it particularly hard. And the, the, and the pain could get worse, with still high commodity prices and wide interest differentials continuing to attract international interest 
in Australian dollar assets. The deficit and debt fueled spending by the government isn't helping. Borrowing $100 million every day in competition with the private sector is keeping interest rates and the Australian dollar higher than they would otherwise be. According to some Australian dollar analysts, it's not inconceivable for the Australian dollar to reach $1.25 sometime over the next 12 to 18 months. It is now time to carefully consider what a comparatively high Australian dollar means for key sectors of our economy. These pressures have led to considerable debate in recent months about government assistance to particular industry sectors. Let's be clear. It is not an absence of government assistance that has caused the current difficulties for some manufacturing, tourism, retail and other businesses. Rather, it is the choices made by consumers, either because of higher prices or because of changing consumer preferences. The brutal truth is that it will be managers and consumers, not government, which determine the fate of individual businesses. Having said that, when it comes to industries more generally, the government should not stand idly by. We may pay a price in the longer term for the potential hollowing out of the economy as a result of some of the structural challenges, particularly if the international forces propelling the Australian dollar to new highs turn out to be short-lived. The Coalition's view is that government may be able to help by assisting the process of transition. There may be a role in certain circumstances for a government to assist industries to restructure onto a sustainable footing. <coughs> Excuse me. There may also be a role for initiatives to help displace workers, uh, such as retraining, education, relocation allowances. We should not, however, be in the business of propping up industries that, for many reasons, do not have a sustainable future in Australia. This is an issue which requires a full and open public debate. On gaining government, the Coalition will ask the Productivity Commission to investigate the structural changes impacting particular industries and to recommend appropriate government responses. To leverage this improved productivity and boost the overall pace of economic growth, we also need to grow the size of the workforce, and we'll do this in two ways. The first will be to lift domestic labour force participation. Labour force participation declined over 2011. This means that less people who should be in the workforce uh, have, uh, have stopped looking. More people have given up, and that's not good enough. Uh, this is a poor endorsement of some of the government's current policies. The Coalition is committed to the participation policies announced in the last election, with programs to encourage young people to get a job by going to where the work is, and programs to encourage employers to retain and hire more mature workers. Under the Coalition, there will be a strong focus on skilled immigration, including through a liberalised 457 visa program, removing the industrial barriers put in place by the Labor Party and the unions. We're not suggesting it should be open slather to bring in imported labour, but where local skills are not available or cannot be quickly developed, the 457 program provides a very useful safety valve. That's why we introduced it. Labor smothered the program with excessive rules and requirements, and there was a malevolent motivation behind that. The Coalition will restore access to the scheme as provided under the Howard Government. We will remove the union-driven roadblocks, allowing business to quickly access the critical skills they need while maintaining important safeguards and sanctions against those who seek to abuse the scheme. So integral to a more productive and larger workforce will be improved workplace relations. We must have a more mature and sophisticated debate about this policy area and the implications of further change. Tony Abbott and the Coalition have said on many occasions that work choice is dead, buried, cremated, and I repeat it again today. However, it is becoming clear that the government's changes to industrial relations have made the system less flexible and more bound by regulation. It also appears increased union power is again leading to increased levels of dis disputation. Over the year to the September quarter, 214,000 days were lost to industrial disputes. That was a 50% increase in days lost compared to September 2010. It's almost double the days lost 
over the uh, year to September 2009. These developments are not in the best interests of workers and they're not in the best interests of the country. The Coalition recently vigorously opposed the abolition of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. In government, we will reinstate the ABCC with all its original powers. We will release a comprehensive workplace relations policy before the next election. Fourth and final area is one of the actions government can take to assist economic growth is obviously facilitate new opportunities for business. And we've always been active in helping business to focus on new markets overseas. The Coalition's been a strong supporter of the Export Market Development Grant Scheme. The Coalition also negotiated bilateral free trade agreements with key trading partners uh, to facilitate stronger trade flows. But there's more to be done. And the greatest opportunity to improve engagement with Asia <coughs> is through these sort of uh, bilateral agreements. Even though Australia is already a major supplier of iron ore, coal and other commodities to the region, we should be looking to broaden our trade links in areas such as tourism, education, health and financial services. To do this, I envisage regions of economic specialisation across Australia. The North West should be the centre of our sphere of opportunity in the Indian Ocean. Our opportunity to use the mineral and energy wealth of the North West to provide a clean, sustainable energy source for Asia through the export of natural gas and to resource the industrialisation of rapidly developing economies through iron ore and other exports. Darwin should be the centre of our sphere of mutual obligation with Asia. We share common goals in fighting global terrorism, halting people smuggling and providing economic and social stability. Far North Queensland should be the hub for fulfilling our sphere of responsibility in the Pacific Rim. We should work with our Pacific neighbours to ensure they have the skills and capacity to underpin a robust economic future with an emphasis on poverty reduction. In addition to that, the whole of Northern Australia offers vast untapped potential as a centre for food production servicing Asia and beyond. What is needed uh, for food production is permanent and reliable supplies of water. Let me assure you, there's plenty of it up there. My colleague Andrew Robb has been leading a review of the regional development strategy with a particular focus on improving water infrastructure. And again, we'll have more to say about this before the election. So believe it or not, there are a number of other issues, and I know you find it hard to believe, that I haven't touched on today, such as foreign investment policy, corporate governance issues, regulator roles and responsibilities, and global multilateral duties, to name a few. Rest assured, we're doing a huge amount of work in all of these and other areas. We are preparing for government. And underpinning our plan for a stronger economy is a clear vision of what a good government should look like. A government, this government was forged in the fires of deceit. For too long, Australia has had a government that is dysfunctional, dishonest and incoherent. And it's got to change. We will be consistent, we will be transparent. We will lay down a clear plan for the future and we will methodically and openly implement the plan. A coalition government will be true to its word, uh, will do what we say and will say what we do. A coalition government will restore integrity, the process of government, and we will restore uh, people's confidence in government, which has been sadly lacking over so long. However we govern, how we govern will be as important as what we do. Economic growth is the cornerstone of future prosperity. And our goal is a bigger economy with more jobs. Our goal is a smaller government with less tax, less regulation and greater personal responsibility. Our goal is to live within our means and to ease upward pressure on interest rates and the exchange rate. Our goal is to restore confidence, the confidence of consumers, small business people, so that they can take the long-term decisions on spending investment. In the end, it will be the coalition that will restore hope, reward and opportunity for Australia. Thank you very much. That's the Shadow Treasurer, Joe Hockey, speaking there from the New South Wales Business Chamber in Sydney, outlining the coalition's four-point plan, if you like, 